we should get going again. Find your seat and we'll get on to the second speech. Uh, just a reminder about the questions. Make sure that if you have questions, you submit them either on Faith PRC's website, Seminary's website. There is a website devoted to the conference. Five 500, so 500threformation.com. 500th Reformation, no spaces, dot com. And there too, you can submit a question. All the questions will be answered on that website, the website that's devoted to the conference. Mr. Gary Vanderscaff has a large selection of books, new and used. We want to uh, just call your attention to a couple. The biography, this was John Calvin by Thea Van Hulsema, a nice introductory level biography, junior high, high school kids in particular. Put that in the hands of your children or grandchildren. There is a fairly new book, Reformation Women. 16th Century Figures Who Shaped Christianity's Rebirth by Rebecca Van Doydeward. That is a nice book on the wives of the reformers. He's out of Katie My Rib, the well-known biography of Martin Luther's wife, Katharina Van Bora. Uh, there are some nice works that have come out this year on her as well as the other women of the Reformation. There is a nice series of biographies for young people, children, uh, written by Simonetta Carr. Here are a couple of them, Martin Luther and Augustine. Gary has a large selection of them. They're only 10 bucks. You cannot go wrong. He also has a large selection of the Reformation Heritage KJV Study Bible. Beginning, they're all half price, beginning at 20 bucks, and up from there, there are some more expensive leather-bound volumes, but all for 50% off. Look over the selection that he has. Now, I want to introduce our second speaker this morning. Uh, Professor Russell Dykstra graduated from Grand Valley State University in 1976 and began a teaching career. He taught for a few years in the Hull, Iowa Protestant Reformed Christian School. In 1980, however, not being able successfully to evade the call to the ministry, he left teaching and began to pursue the ministry. In 1986, he graduated from the Protestant Reformed Seminary and the same year was ordained into office in the Dune, Iowa Protestant Reformed Church. In 1995, he accepted the call to the Hope PRC in Walker, Michigan, where he served briefly until accepting the appointment to teach in the Protestant Reformed Seminary in 1996. He has been at the seminary ever since. He is professor of church history and New Testament studies. He and his wife, Carol, have nine married children and many grandchildren. He will address us this morning on the topic, the Reformation's response to the radical Reformation. Professor Dykstra. Thank you, Professor Kamingham. Good morning and welcome. If you have a problem with eyesight, you should be up in front if you like to read what I have on the screen. The Reformation is a very dear subject 
and it's a very well-known subject from many points of view. And almost everyone in the Protestant, in the Presbyterian or Reformed churches know names like Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and Knox. But today our topic is with an aspect of the Reformation about which most of us know very little. It's called the Radical Reformation. It's called the Radical Reformation because it consists mostly of people who initially came to the Reformation. They left Rome, the only church in the Western world, and they came to the Reformation for a time. And they were even, some of them, actively involved in the Reformation, as we'll see. But for various reasons, they moved beyond Luther and Calvin and began to take radical positions on certain things and became their own movement. It is a very extremely diverse group of people that we seek to treat today. There are those that are called the Anabaptists, and that they are called that because in their day they had been baptized as children, but they became convinced that that was not a proper baptism, so they, be, they were re-baptized. That's what the name Anabaptist means, re-baptism. Others in this group claim to have special revelation from the Holy Spirit. They were called spiritualists. Others were radical revolutionaries who tried to take over cities and establish the kingdom of God here on this earth. They were looking for the millennium, a thousand year reign where they would take over the world and put to death all unbelievers. And then there were, fourthly, men who denied the truth, any truth that they could not prove rationally. The Bible was not enough. They had to be able to prove it with a logical argument, and if they didn't, were not able to do that, they would not believe it. So they, were, they would deny such cardinal truths as the Trinity and the Incarnation. This is a widely diverse group of people that are covered under the Radical Reformation. The importance of this, obviously God is in control of all these things and God determined it. He determined that there would be a reformation. He also determined that there would be a radical reformation, that these people would arise. And the reason for that is partly that the church then would have to deal with this, that the reformation would have to deal with this aspect. God uses this to sharpen the church. God uses error always to make the truth ever more clear. And that certainly is the case with the radical Reformation. They would be forced to develop in areas of doctrine and worship and church polity that they would not have developed nearly as quickly if it were not for the Radical Reformation. So it forced them to develop these doctrines very clearly. The areas of Rome they were facing on the one hand idolatry, works righteousness, the Pope hierarchy, the seven sacraments, on and on you could go. But now on the other hand, they have the errors of the Radical Reformation to deal with. Rejecting infant baptism, wrong ideas of the church, of the sacraments, wrong ideas of the magistrates, and the coming of Christ and the work of the Spirit in the church in this day. Calvin was very conscious of this, and when he replied to what we in America call Sadolet, the Roman Catholic uh, bishop. Very, very important, I agree. We should all read this repeatedly. Calvin said this, We are assailed by two sects. He's talking to the Roman Catholic bishop now. We are assailed by two sects which seem to differ most widely from each other. For what similitude is there in appearance between the Pope and the Anabaptists? And yet, he says, here it is, the principal weapon with which they both assail us is the same. For when they, the Anabaptists, boast extravagantly of the Spirit, the tendency that certainly is to sink and bury the Word of God, that they may make room for their own falsehoods. Rome would bury the Word of God in one way. The Anabaptists would bury it by saying, we don't need the Word of God, we have the Spirit. That's what some of them 
were saying. Again, wide variety, not all Anabaptists said that, but many did. So God is in control. It forced them to develop their doctrines more clearly, but there's another aspect to this that would affect the whole of the Reformation. That is, the radicals who were revolutionaries who began to take up the sword and try to conquer cities and say, we're part of the Reformation. We're taking Luther's teaching and applying it here to this social situation. The enemies of the Reformation would latch on to that and say, oh, so that's the Reformation. This is what the Reformation brings about. And the king of France, in fact, would persecute the Reformed people in his country and excuse it to the Germans saying, oh, no, no, I'm not persecuting Reformed. I'm persecuting the Anabaptists in France. And the Germans would say, well, Anabaptists, okay, but not Reformed. So he was linking the two together. And from the time that the radicals, revolutionaries, rose up, the Reformers were trying to distance themselves, show we are not Anabaptists. That's not what we are, not these revolutionaries. So it would have a tremendous effect on the Reformation as they tried to separate themselves from these radicals. So we will look then at the Reformation's response to the radical Reformation, and we have four areas. We'll have a brief overview looking at the history and the doctrinal positions that they took, then Martin Luther and his radicals in Wittenberg, Calvin and the radicals, and finally some lessons for today. Brief history then. We start with Martin Luther and Wittenberg because this is where they appeared first in, in this history. After the Diet of Worms, where Luther made his courageous stand for the Scriptures and against error, at that point, the emperor put a ban on him. His life was in danger. And re you recall, perhaps, that his friends then kidnapped him and took him off to the castle, Wartburg, where he stayed for some 11 months. During that 11-month absence from Wittenberg, there were some monumental changes happening in his city. And they were led especially by a man named Karlstad, referred to earlier this morning, sometimes with a C, sometimes with a K. Karlstad is a man who had stood with Luther. He was a trusted associate. He had debated the Roman Catholics at a point with Luther. And now with Luther gone, he's taking over the lead in the Reformation in Wittenberg. Karlstad began to promote radical changes. First of all, on the Lord's Supper, you know that when the people of, of the church came for the Mass, they would come up to the front of the table, and before they could partake of Mass, they had to have had confession with a priest to confess their sins, and then after that, they would come get down on their knee, knees, and the priest would give them a wafer right on the tongue, so it would not spill on the ground, no wine, and then the people would leave. That was the Lord's Supper for them. Karlstad said, this is all wrong, we need to change this now. And the first thing he said is, no more confession no more confession. You don't need to confess your sins to men. You confess them to God and you come to the Lord's table. Secondly, when you come here, you're going to have bread and wine. And you will take that bread in your hands and put it in your mouth. And you will take that cup in your hand and you will drink it. Everyone who comes to communion, that's what's happening from now on. And the people were terrified. All their life. They had celebrated the Lord's Supper the other way. And now suddenly, here's Karlstad saying, no, no, oh, that's all done. Now it will be done this way, this way. Tremendous confusion. The monasteries, he said, they're cesspools of iniquity. Empty the monasteries. and Empty the converts. And by the way, you should be married. Get married. You took a vow not to be married? Break the vow. It doesn't matter. Now it's time to get married. Idols in the church, we heard about that, smash them, cover them up, paint them over, get rid of anything that's an image in the church. And by the way, the Pope said you may eat on, meet on Fridays, eat it, 
everyone, eat meat. No more fish, eat the meat on Friday. Then he got some reinforcement from men called the Zwickau prophets because they're from the city of Zwickau and they claim to have special revelations. Men by the name of Storch and Stubner. One was a weaver. They were not preachers. They were men who just suddenly started to get visions from the Holy Spirit, they said. That's what they claimed. And they, they, they came to Wittenberg and they would assist in this reformation. They questioned the value of the Bible study. Why do you need the Bible after all? If you can get messages from the Spirit, put your Bible away. And if you do not need the Bible, you really don't need to read any longer either. Close the schools. They're dangerous. Let the children learn to get messages from the Spirit. They're far better off than reading the Holy Scriptures. So that's what Luther encountered in Wittenberg. And he would have to come out of hiding in order to deal with this. The confusion, the turmoil, the the upheaval in the church in Wittenberg. We'll come back to that, how he dealt with it. Then this Reformation took a violent turn. The Peasants' Rebellion in 1524. Thomas Munzer is a man who was quite instrumental in this. Thomas Munzer was a very learned man who also left the Church of Rome went for Luther, though only for a very short time. He was influenced by one of those Wickau prophets, Storch, who cla- and so he now, Munzer, claimed he was getting special revelations from the Holy Spirit. And he had a very definite indi- tendency toward looking for a millennium. We have to make the millennium come. It's about to happen. We're at the end of the ages, and the church needs to take over the world. He claimed he could identify the elect and distinguish the elect from the reprobate. And then, since he could do that, he said the elect need to come together and kill all the non-elect with the sword. Now, at this point, we come into another area where he would be very effective among the peasants. The unlearned peasants had a very difficult lot, and he is now starting to take what he says is at least somewhat Luther's view, that the Pope has no authority to rule the soul. Well, how do these men then have the right to rule over me as a peasant? Freedom. And he began to preach that the Lord would give them the victory if they would take up the sword against these rulers that had no right to be rulers and the magistrates who had no right to be magistrates. We can put them all to death and take over the land. And so you have the Peasants' Rebellion of 1525 where the peasants decide they are going to take over their area of the world. Luther's response to that, I can tell you, was extremely negative. He wrote something called against the robbing and murdering hordes of peasants, in which he encouraged the people, the, the rulers, to kill the rebels. They're simply rebels. They have to be dealt with that way and put to death Munzer, who is their ringleader, and they did. The result for Luther is he never trusted the peasants again. He didn't believe that they had enough knowledge, enough principle in them to be good elders who could rule the church. And so instead of allowing that to take place, that there would be elders who would rule the church, he said what we need is the Erastian form of church government where the Christian rulers become the rulers in the church. They're the men with education. They have understanding of the Scriptures. These are the men that need to be the rulers of the church, the Erastian form of church government. So that had an effect immediately on Luther's thinking and the church even that he led. More violence. And all the people here who are Dutch can cover their head in shame. The followers of Munzer were even more radical. The Pope is Antichrist. Christ is coming. 
Hans Hut predicted the return of Christ. He said we need to gather 144,000 saints together because that's all there are. 144,000, gather them together and we'll establish the kingdom of Christ. John Matthijs, good Dutchman, set up 12 apostles. He declared himself to be Enoch and he selected another one of the radicals, Hoffman, to be Elijah. And he said, we are the two witnesses of, a re of Revelation chapter 11. We will go forth and we will conquer and no one will be able to destroy us. In 1534, they took over the city of Munster in Germany and declared it the New Jerusalem. And after Matthias was killed, Jan of Leiden, another good Dutchman, declared himself the king of righteousness, instituted polygamy, and took several wives to himself. Well, the consequences of that were extreme. The Catholics and the Protestants joined their armies together and crushed this rebellion. And that would enable the Romish church and rulers to brand the revolution, the Reformation, from now on as revolutionary. This is what the, Revolu what the Reformation produces. And it would lead the Reformers to that constant effort of trying to distinguish themselves from these radicals. You find that, you find this effort to distinguish the true Reformed people from the radicals in the Belgic Confession. Article 36 says in part this, after talking about the rulers, Wherefore we detest the Anabaptists and other seditious people, and in general all those who reject the higher powers and magistrates and would subvert justice, introduce community of goods, and confound that decency and good order which God hath established among men. We are not the radicals. That's what the Reformed people wanted to be plain, even in their confessions. Well, that's the extreme radicals. That's the revolutionaries. But they are, of course, somewhat linked to Anabaptists because they share some common ideas. The Anabaptists, moving away a bit from the radical revolutionaries now, the Anabaptists would arise in all the major city centers of the Reformation. So let's look at the teaching of the Anabaptists. Their first concern was the purity of the church. They were concerned about the purity of the church. They had legitimate concerns. Rome from which they had come was a cesspool of iniquity. And the, the Reformation had a long, long ways to go before the corruption that was in their churches was cleaned up. And they were extremely concerned that it was not happening and that some of the doctrines of Luther was actually encouraging godliness. How so? Well, infant baptism, they said, that's, that's part of the problem. Infant baptism. Under Rome, they baptized everybody in the whole city. If you were a member of the, the city, take your baby in and get baptized. And that meant they were part of the church. And then obviously not every baptized child is a believer, so you have all these unbelievers in the church. Well, under the Reformers, that was improving. But they were struggling with that. The people were used to bringing their children to baptism, and, and there were not clear membership roles the way we have them so nicely in a Reformed church today. And so there is that difficult transition, and many people are bringing their children to baptism, even though they really aren't faithful members of the church at all. There is, a, there is an issue there. So the Anabaptists said, therefore, no infant baptism. Get rid of it. We'll wait till they are adults and they make a confession of faith. Then we will baptize them because then they're, we know they're, bap they're believers. On the other hand, they had issues with man and salvation. Total depravity. They were not convinced of the doctrine of total depravity. They also believed in the freedom of the will. That man had the ability to choose at least the good. Justification by faith alone they questioned. They said, this is one of the doctrines that's encouraging godliness because if I'm justified by faith and without works, then what's the incentive to doing good works? And they very much questioned that central doctrine of the Reformation. 
Some of them taught that it was possible that you could arrive at perfection. If you would work hard enough at it, you could be, live without sin. And then this strange thing too, again concerned about sin with the human nature of Jesus Christ, they said he didn't really have a human nature from Mary. God created a special human nature and implanted it into her womb. And that's the human nature that he had different from Mary because Mary was sinful. They were dealing with that problem. So how could Christ possibly be without sin if he, didn't, if he had Mary's human nature? This error is condemned in both the Belgic Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. So you have issues, but they're all rooted in a desire to have a pure church. Now, that, that's a good thing to desire. Calvin wanted it. Luther wanted it. This is their way of going about it, reaching for a pure church. Their second great concern was the government. The reality is that the government was far too involved in the life of the church. In the Middle Ages, you had the, the government becoming the agent of the church. The church would condemn the heretic and then give the heretic over to the government and say, burn them. Okay, that's the way it went. The government is far too involved in the affairs of the church. The reformers were backing off from that. They were trying to get the church out of the affair, that got, got the government out of the affairs of the church. But Luther, he, re, he went back to Erastianism because he didn't trust the peasants. The Anabaptists said, see, you're just like Rome. Luther, or Calvin rather, the Swiss reform had a different practice. When a man would come into a Swiss city, he would preach, and then there would be conflict in a, a Roman Catholic city. There would be conflict, and the rulers of the city would then have, let's say, let's have a debate between the Reformed and the Roman Catholic. And whoever wins, that's what this city will become. So the city would become Reformed because the rulers voted that all the church services from now on will be Reformed services, not Roman Catholic. The Anabaptists said, see, still too much government in your churches. But they started to go beyond that. Legitimate concerns that they had were increased to being very skeptical of all the authority of the government. They questioned whether this, the government really had sword power, whether they really could tax, whether they may require oaths of anyone. May the government do that? Require an oath when Jesus says, swear not at all? Perhaps governments are only a necessary evil. And others were saying, Let's, maybe we need to go back to the Old Testament laws, have some kind of a theonomy. <clears throat> Menno Simons is a man who <clears throat> belongs in the, <clears throat> in the area of the Radical Reformations, though much of what we said he would not agree with. Menno Simons of Friesland rejected the use of all force. He was a Roman Catholic priest. He rejected infant baptism, but he also said, no swords. John Matthias, John of Leiden, wrong. That's not how you spread the truth. You preach the word. But he did, over concern of a pure church, reject infant baptism as well. He is the father of the Mennonites who are found in America as well. Some were even more radical, the spiritualists. They despised the dead letter of the Bible. We have the Holy Spirit. Why would you read the dead letter if you can have messages from the Holy Spirit? And they despised offices in the church because, after all, we all have the Spirit. Who says the minister should be the one that preaches? Anybody can get up and preach when they have the Spirit speaking to them. And then the more radical group also is the rationalists, represented in Calvin's life by Michael Servetus, a rank heretic who denied that Jesus is the Son of God, rejected the Trinity, and as you know, was put to death. So Sinians also were rationalists who said we can only believe what we can prove. And they were also then people that denied the Trinity. They became Unitarians. And they denied justification by faith. And interesting, 
there is a link to the, the influence that the Socinians had on some of the remonstrants in the Netherlands, the Armenian controversy. So there is plenty of influence spreading out from the radical Reformation. So three kinds of radicals, essentially, the Anabaptists, the spiritualists who said we get special revelation, and then the rationalists who said we need only, we may only believe what we can prove. There's a lot of back and forth, overlap and so on, but essentially those three groups are found in the radical Reformation. So what's the Reformation's response to that? Start with Luther. Luther in general, um, you know how Luther would respond when someone attacked him, he would attack back, and he did. And he said, this movement is of the devil. This movement of, of Munzer and all the rest, it's of the devil. And he was right. The trouble is that when some of the Swiss reformers took a position that he thought was kind of like Karl Stotz on the on the Lord's Supper, he put them all together. Swiss reformers, Anabaptists, they're all of the devil. Whoa, there's a problem. Because the Swiss reformers were not of the devil. Just because they disagreed with Luther's view on the Lord's Supper. So in some ways, his response was not very helpful. But now I want to show you a different Luther than what you're used to. You're used to this man who would throw out the lightning bolts against his enemies. I'm going to show you a Luther that is pastoral, moving, and how he dealt with the radical reformation in Wittenberg. When Luther was in Wittenberg, was it, when he was in Wartburg, he was forced to come back to Wittenberg to deal with the conflict that he had in Wittenberg. And he did so in a series of eight sermons. And the first thing he did in that sermon is to set forth briefly the essence of the gospel. The essence of the gospel. And that is, we are all children of wrath. Every single one of us. We all deserve to be destroyed. Our works are nothing. God sent his son in order to save us from our sin. And then he got right to the point. But what of faith? What of faith? With faith, we must have love. We must have love. Without love, faith is nothing. And he said to the radicals and the people following them, I see no love in you. I see no love. Love is not merely talk, Luther said. It's words, it's deeds, it's exercises. And not only love, we need patience. We need to have some patience. Faith trusts in God and in His work in others. God will work in the fellow believers. God will do that. I, I can be patient for that. So we must not now insist, oh, I have my rights. I have the right to the bread and the wine. That's my right. But rather see that we have to be helpful and useful to the brother. He points out, not all have the same strength of faith. We're not all there. We're not all as far along in the pathway. We must be patient with each other. He says, quote, the cause is good, but there has been too much haste. For there are still brothers and sisters on the other side who belong to us and must be won. We have to win them, he says, not force them. Specifically, he applies it to the Mass. There are some things in this, in worship, that you must do. There are some things that are a choice. You have to make a difference between what you must do in order to have a proper worship service, and what things are a choice. Do not make a must out of what is free. The Mass, he says, as a sacrifice, that has to go. As a work of merit, 
That has to go. That's evil. But how are you going to change the people? He said, it's not by grabbing them by the hair and dragging them away from it. That's not how you change people. Not in the church. Preach the word. That's what you must do. Preach the word. And the results, he said, will be left solely to God's good pleasure. He will work by his word. He condemns forcing people to change. If you do, he said, you can force them to change. But then they don't understand why you made them change. They don't even really agree with it because they, they have no understanding. Preach, instruct Teach them. That's the way you lead people to change. He points that out. This is exactly what happened in his experience. I opposed indulgences in all the papists, but never with force. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my friends, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing. The word did nothing everything. Be careful about laws, he said. Be careful about laws. One law will soon make two, and two will increase to three, and so forth, he says. He saw the the danger of legalism in the church as well. In the third sermon, he gets to the matter of marriage of monks and nuns, and he reminds them There's things that must be done, and there are free choices. Don't don't mix the two together. If a priest or a monk cannot abstain, let them marry. But don't force them to marry. Don't do that. Concerning images, we heard a bit about that. He said they're not necessary, and, and therefore we are free to have them or not. We're free to have them or not, though it is better not to have them The solution, he says, if you would have preached that images are nothing, they would have fallen of themselves, as we heard, tear them out of the hearts of the people, and then they won't care about them. Then you can take them out. But to sit there with a hammer and smash them before the people are ready for it, not a good way to proceed. In the fourth sermon, he continues on the matter of images, and he says they are not to be worshipped, they are nothing. He makes an analogy. Wine and women make, bring many a man to misery and make a fool of him. So what shall we do? Kill all the women and pour out all the wine? His point is, the images are nothing. It's how people use them. That's the problem. That was his view. Not saying I necessarily agree with that. But he has a point about how to proceed in this matter. Concerning meats, he said, if you need meat for your health's sake, eat it. If the Pope says you mayn't eat it, well, eat it just to spite the Pope. But don't force people. Don't force them to do this before they are ready to partake of meat on Friday. Taking both of the elements, once again, you don't need to. Forcing them to touch the bread, forcing them to take the wine when they are not ready That means they're coming to the Lord's table and they're thinking, am I sinning? May I do this? Then it becomes sin to them because they are not doing it by faith. Instruct the people. You are correct. No, he he says this, a moving statement of Luther. I dare say that none of my enemies, though they have caused me much sorrow, have wounded me as you have. Because they had wounded his sheep. They hadn't attacked him. He could deal with that. They had caused turmoil and trouble and consternation among the sheep. That's why he was so wounded by the radicals. Your position was correct, he said, but the manner of proceeding was all wrong. You need love. You need patience. You need to be instructing the people 
not what you're doing. There's Luther the pastor. John Calvin. Cal John Calvin would have a, a more measured reaction. He would be able to make distinctions that Luther did not always make. In other words, he would, just, he would say there are some radicals who, who reject the authority of the Scriptures, libertines and spiritualists, people who say they get special messages from the Spirit, I don't need the Bible, libertines who say we can live as we please regardless of what the Bible says. Those people, they've rejected the authority of Scripture. That's one group of people. There are others, he says, though they be full of wicked and pernicious errors, yet doth abide in much more simplicity, for she yet receiveth the Holy Scripture as we do. He wasn't denying that they had some really bad errors, some heresies in their church. But he said, these people I can talk to because they hold to the Scriptures. Make a distinction, he said, between those two different kinds of radicals. In the 1536 Institutes, which he wrote his very first copy, his motive really was to show that the Reformed faith was not radical. It was not radical. That's one of the main things in, of purposes for writing it. And in his dedicatory letter to the king of France, he made that abundantly plain. He was totally respectful to the king, but he pleaded with him not to identify the radicals with the Reformation, two entirely different groups. He rejected it in that he distinguished in the Institutes very clearly between the two groups. He rejected separation from the church and dividing the church with strange doctrine. He rejected the perfect church notion of the Anabaptists, though he insisted on good Christian discipline. He, he dealt with the meaning and use of the sacraments in order to show how they were different from the Anabaptists, the importance of the Word of God over against the spiritualists, and infant baptism received a larger treatment to show we teach that, we practice that. Other things he covered were the major issues of the, some of the Anabaptists, the oath, honoring civil government, pacifism, and taxes. He addressed all of that in his 1536 Institutes at the age of 26. Amazing. He had encounters with the Anabaptists. He did already in Geneva. There were men who came there, again, Dutchmen who came with Anabaptist ideas and they were causing trouble and they had to have disputations, public debates between the two before the, finally the Anabaptists were sent out of town. In Strasbourg, he also encountered them when he was in exile from Geneva. In Strasbourg, there was no place that did as much careful treatment of the Anabaptists, trying to win them over. And Kelvin took hold of that spirit. He had a tremendous amount of success working with the Anabaptists, number one, because he insisted on good Christian discipline. So he didn't allow sin simply to go unchecked in the congregation. He restricted who could come to the Lord's table by that discipline. And he was a tremendous polemicist as well and could argue the case. His honesty and his forthrightness and his ability to teach won a number of Anabaptists over to him, and they became Reformed. In fact, he would later marry one of the wives, a widow, of an Anabaptist. He also had encounters in Geneva after he returned in 1541. He wrote an entire thing against the Sleitheim Confession, which was the major confession of the Anabaptists. He wrote against the Libertines called the Spiritualists, and he had to deal with Michael Servetus. So he had a lot of opportunities to deal with them. Doctrinal development then for Kelvin especially involved the area of infant baptism and subtitle, The Covenant. The covenant. That's where he would develop in his doctrine because of all of the times he had to deal with them. First of all, he had to show what is the relationship between circumcision and baptism. And when you read John Calvin's explanation of this, you say, is this my baptism form? Oh no, it's Calvin. We're drawing from Calvin, showing the connection between circumcision and baptism. The unity of the Old and New Testaments, that it's essentially one church. One church. 
He had to develop that, and he did marvelously. And the covenant, it's the covenant. Where do children fit in the covenant? He had to deal with that question. Why do we baptize children? Because they're in the covenant. And he explained that as well. He talked about the tremendous blessings for parents that their children are baptized. And the blessing for the child, even long after he leaves the baptism fount. Baptism is a benefit, a blessing for that child. He answered objections that the the Anabaptists brought. Children can't understand it, so why are you baptizing them? He said, baptism isn't only good for that moment. It extends for the rest of their life. They can look back at that. It's a benefit to to them. Faith isn't present. He had some arguments about that one way or the other that are not all that helpful all, all the time. But then he made this interesting observation. The Baptists are always saying, there's not one instance in all of the New Testament where you have a baby baptized. That's what they insist. We, we could disagree with that. But Kelvin says, um, there's not one instance in the whole New Testament of a record of a woman taking communion. So what does that mean? We may let them take communion? Nice argument. He drew up his own baptism form because he knew how important it was that good instruction be connected with baptism so that God's people would understand what are we doing in baptism. A lot of other areas of development will only briefly indicate he had to deal with the sacraments, the meaning of them, and especially the Lord's Supper because that was a debated issue with the Anabaptists. They looked at the Lord's Supper as being merely a commemoration, merely a commemoration. You're not partaking of anything. In the church, you had to deal with the fact that the church is important, out of which there is no salvation. He rejected the idea of a perfect church. He developed the idea of visible and invisible. Really, you can root root that in in Calvin, that very important idea. Yes, you you can see the church in her institution, but there's an invisible church, the gathering of the elect. He wasn't the first one to say it, but he made it very clear. He talked about the offices. That's important. We don't want to deny the office of believer, but we must not then throw out the special offices and their significance. Emphasize Christian discipline. Talked about the relationship of the Spirit and the Word. Yes, the Spirit is working, is important, but He doesn't work separate from the Word. We don't throw out the Bible. We hold to it. The Spirit will help us understand. And the proper view of the magistrates as well. They dealt with a lot. And let us try to learn a bit from the Anabaptists and that history. First of all, radicals come in every reform. In absolutely every reform, you will find radicals. They are attracted to reform movements. They they are attracted to them. There's something new there. There's something radical change that appeals to them. But they come for the wrong reason. You know, the, the Protestant Reformed churches had this in our history as well. In 1924, there were a whole lot of people that came along for the wrong reason. They didn't really understand the issues of common grace and the well-meant offer. They didn't. But they came along. A lot of times it's because they're following a man. They don't understand the issues, but they follow the minister. That's a very dangerous thing, which which arises out of what was talked about last night. If the office of believer is uninformed, if he doesn't know anything, well, then he just follows a man, whether he understands or not. Intense suspicion. There were those in the period between 24 and 53 who were intensely suspicious about other people and wanting to condemn people very quickly and Here's the good ministers, and there's the bad ministers, and, and, and looking around the congregation, and I, I, I don't know if I can trust that family. They, they seem kind of wishy-washy on the covenant. My own grandmother 
was talking to someone at a church picnic. Someone that one of the radicals in her congregation judged was one of those very suspicious members of the congregation. And as she's talking to this other woman, member of the Protestant Reformed churches, this radical woman walked past and said, birds of a feather flock together. In other words, what are you talking to her for? You must be like her. I can't trust you either anymore. Intense suspicion of other people within the congregation and the ministry. And then a hatred and a reviling of the mother church that is excessive. You will not find this in Herman Hoeksema. In Herman Hoeksema, you will find straightforward defense of the truth, attack of the lie, criticism of the mother church, but not hatred and reviling just because he couldn't contain himself. And the radicals would engage in that. And if you would say something nice about the, Protestant, about the Christian Reformed Church, something positive, oh, well, then you obviously are suspect as well. That's the kind of spirit that was found in the Protestant Reformed Church. That's what happens. Reform movements gather radicals, and then there has to be a falling out, and there has to be a time when the preaching will change these things. It takes time. There are different kinds of radicals. There are radicals that have bad theology. There are radicals that have bad lifestyles. But you will find them in every reform. God determines this. And the ways of God are beyond my understanding, beyond my comprehension. And I'm not saying that to be critical. The Lord has all these things in His control. And sometimes radical people, hard suspicious, hard-to-live-with people will drive members out of the church that you know are God's people. And you don't understand why. God has His purposes. He uses all sorts of different ways in the history of the church to accomplish His purposes, which are always good. Always good. But there's a radical spirit that can easily be found, and it's found not only in our churches, Protestant Reform, but it's found in every church. It's, it's always there. I want, I want to warn us against some of these things, and those who are not Protestant Reformed will recognize that we have the ability and the need to critique ourselves as well. The Anabaptists said, we want a pure church. We want a pure church. And they condemned all other churches. Lutherans, Rome, Reformed, nope. Ours is the pure church. That spirit can very easily go into, we are the only true church. We are the only true church. Diagram something like this. If you have a diagram of all the churches, well, there's all the false churches, and right here is the true church, and you write your denominational name there. We are the true church. Everybody else is false church. How different is that from the Anabaptists? We want a pure church. Rome, Luther, Reformed, you're not pure. We are looking for a pure church. The spirit of radicalism can be found anywhere. Radical spirit. Munzer said, I can identify the elect. I can identify the elect. So I know who the non-elect are. A plea. complete condemnation of every person who is not Protestant Reformed, I would say, is in the same line. In the same line. Anybody that's not Protestant Reformed can be condemned? Well, that's exactly what Munster said he could do. I can distinguish between the elect and the reprobate. 
It's the Spirit. A failure to distinguish the enemy when wielding the sword. The church is a militant church. In nothing that I have to say this morning, I want to take away from that. The church is a militant church. The church must be wielding the sword. But as we are wielding the sword, who's our enemy? To, to use Old Testament terms, if it's Goliath coming at me with a sword, I know what I have to do. I have to kill him. And when he falls, I cut off his head and I hang up, I hold it up and say, This is an enemy of the Lord. All right, good. What about if I'm dealing with the ten tribes of Israel? The ten tribes of Israel were apostatizing. They were allowing idolatry and every kind of rank evil into their, their nation. They needed a strong rebuke, a hard word from the prophets, and that's what God sent. But at the same time, as Luther said, there are people yet there who need to be won. I'm not trying to cut off all the heads as I did with Goliath. I'm trying to win them even though they need a strong rebuke. And then if I have a Jehoshaphat who's associating with an Ahab, he needs a strong rebuke too. But he's a brother. He's a brother. A failure to distinguish between the enemy when wielding the sword is a spirit of radicalism. A failure to distinguish between those who have errors but respect the Word of God on the one hand and the confessions from those who disregard them. One of the questions I get when I come back from visiting other churches across the oceans is, are they Protestant Reformed? Well, no. There's a lot of agreement that we have, but they're, no, they're not exactly, and, and I can, we've, we've talked about their disagreements, and we're going to continue to talk about them, but you do understand they love the Word of God. They're committed to the confessions. Well, if they're not Protestant Reformed, what are we doing anything with them for? That's a radical spirit. The proper response is Luther's. Reject the error, but have love, have patience, teach. And with Calvin, make the careful distinctions between those who are enemies of the truth of God, hate the word, seeking to destroy it. I know they have a grievous error. And the error has to be rejected, condemned, in no uncertain terms. But make the careful distinctions when you're dealing with people. And then be clear. Set forth your doctrine as clearly and sharply as you can over against the error because you're trying to help these people to see the glorious truth that God has given but let's guard against radicalism, against undue suspicion, against unnecessary condemnation, against failure to distinguish. We need to pray to God for wisdom and courage. We need courage because my natural inclination is not to pick up the sword. It's to say, well, now let's just not fight. Let's just. We need courage to stand for the truth and if it means that you have to fight, you be willing to fight. You need courage. Where are you going to get that from? We're going to pray to God for courage, but also wisdom. Wisdom. How to use the sword. The right words to speak. May God give us the grace to have both. To combat any possible spirit of radicalism in ourselves, in me, in you. Thank you.
thanks to Professor Dykstra for another fine speech, and thanks especially for the warning against the persistent threat of radicalism.